Hey, okay, well, welcome. This is, uh, let's see, uh, Wednesday of week three. And so we uh, are coming to the end of week three here. Uh, we'll, like normal, do uh, two lectures and a lab today. And uh, the, uh, to my surprise, as I thought about it, uh, the end of week three, this is, this is halfway through uh, summer school. Um, and so give you a little update. Uh, as you guys took that test on Monday, and as I told you, I had uh, car and uh, animal hospital uh, issues. Um, I didn't get a chance to grade it Monday night. Last night I did, um, and I made a, a pretty good uh, uh, step into it, uh, I guess. Uh, and I see, I wouldn't say I got quite halfway done, but I got pretty close to halfway done. So I was uh, very encouraged by how uh, the grading was going. Um, and so I, just to let you know then that I will uh, do the same thing tonight. I'll probably get home around five or six o'clock tonight and I'll, I'll start grading those and uh, probably grade till about 10. And maybe I'll get almost all the way done. I don't think I'll get all the way done, but I'll finish that up Thursday. And so if you wanted to uh, see your grades, grades would be posted uh, probably tomorrow morning uh, uh, sometime. And uh, that uh, being said, uh, I will remind you that I had sent out the links to the solution. So if you haven't got a chance to, to look at those, you, that would be good. Um, or you can wait till you kind of see your uh, uh, score. And when I do that, I'll explain how the, the grading goes, but I'll just say a little bit about it now. Um, it, it's based upon two points for each of the multiple choice. And so those are, you know, you probably know already how many on the multiple choice you got right or, or got wrong. And then the free response is graded on a scale of zero to, to three. And of course, zero if you didn't do anything. And of course, three if you did it uh, completely uh, right. Um, the one and a half, uh, as I mentioned before, is uh, kind of a common score when somebody does half of it, like uh, the ones I was warning you about is uh, students will often just go uh, F equals MA, they get the net force, they stop, but the question asked for what was like the air resistance was, uh, was one of them. And so they didn't continue on past that and they only did half the problem. Um, a score of two or one is also pretty common. I guess I would summarize that as a score of two means uh, you mostly did it right. Um, but there's something wrong about it. And so I would say it's more right than wrong. And then a score of one is, well, you kind of started. There's something of value here, but it's more wrong than it is right. You didn't either go very far or you you got started, but then went totally in the in the wrong direction. So that's how those uh, scorings go. Anyway, so you'll you'll see those score on on, on Thursday. Uh, meanwhile, let's uh, continue to talk about our uh, mechanics here. Um, I'll hold up the uh, again, and uh, we are here on Wednesday of the third week, so June third, and it says here we're supposed to start chapter eleven and commit today to chapter eleven. Uh, we're a little behind, as I mentioned at the end. We didn't quite finish chapter eight. So I'm gonna go ahead and continue to talk about chapter eight and then get started in 11. Then we'll take our 20 minute break and then we'll do the second lecture. And I might still be behind. I'd be surprised if we actually finished chapter 11, but that would be great. Uh, because chapter 11 is kind of a long chapter. Uh, Fairly straightforward chapter, but a, a long chapter. And I'll even say in uh, chapter 11, you'll see this that uh, uh, we, we, well, we totally uh, switch gears. And so like I was saying at the end of the video last time, uh, the goal here is to really spend a disproportionate amount of time here on mechanics because that's your next big class, Physics 121, where you'll just do nothing but mechanics all semester long. And so you'll take these first eight chapters and expand upon them, use things like calculus, uh, and it's a, it's a bigger class in the sense that it's more units, and so you'll spend uh, four hours uh, per week instead of three hours uh, per week. And uh, anyway, so like I said, my, my, my goal here and my teaching strategy is to, again, do a disproportionate amount on mechanics so that you guys will be uh, hopefully well prepared for the next uh, level. All right, well, coming back to where we left off, and so I guess one of the advantages of uh, 
of doing these uh, videos is nobody else is really using the whiteboard. So overnight I just left uh, this table on here and so let's just continue to talk about this table and I'll say it again uh, what makes chapter 8 a doable chapter and not seem so long and overwhelming is to make sure you see the analogy between the rotational physics that we're doing and see how it is the same or at least paralleling the translational uh, mechanics. And so we're going to see that everything we did for translational motions in chapters 1 through 7, so this side of our big table, has a parallel to rotational uh, mechanics. And so we had left off with Newton's uh, second law, really, that the relationship between uh, torque, now that we're talking about rotation instead of force, and rotational inertia instead of just regular inertia or mass, gives us our angular acceleration. And I spent a long time pointing out the difference between mass and rotational inertia and also the difference between force and torque. So as I continue uh, along here, the torque, now that we've discussed it, is really a good time to come back and mention, and i got some items down here that we've already seen, uh, but the center of mass discussion came up a little bit earlier and I said we would revisit it in chapter 8. Well here we are and so let me put on the board here uh, two uh, words, two concepts. The, the first one is uh, center of mass and the second one then is what we'll call the stability of an object or a, a building. And you might recall that when we were doing uh, Newton's second law for translational motion, and I showed you some pictures in the book, and your, your author had a picture of a wrench. Uh, I didn't have a wrench. I held up this hammer. So I'll hold this, this hammer again. But if I were to, you know, toss the hammer across the room, and as we said in Newton's second law, so I guess that was chapter 3, F equals MA, or in chapter 4 where we did a projectile and we said it would follow a parabola, we said that there was a magical point on the object, which then we called the center of mass. And so that's what I want to come back to, the, the center of mass. And we said that is the magical point that would follow a parabola. And so taking this, this, this hammer, if you will, if I were to toss it ac across the room, and I don't want to uh, break anything, so I won't toss it uh, very far, but if you, if you look at that little red piece there and I, and I toss it across the room, this, this, this red dot here uh, should be following a parabola. It's the rest of the object that then rotates around it. And so you can see that the discussion on a center of mass really requires you to talk about rotations and torques while you're talking about the translational motion. And so that's why I said it's uh, better to show this now that we are here with uh, rotation. And what I wanted to emphasize, and we said it before, the center of mass is not the center of the object. You see that best with this object where I took a, a, a heavier sphere, bigger sphere, and a smaller sphere, connected them with a little metal rod, and I said where is the center of mass. In other words, if you tossed this thing across the room, or if you just held it underneath, where do you have to hold it to support it? What is the point as if all of this mass was condensed to one place, where would it be? And that's called the center of mass. But to understand a little bit of conceptual behind the center of mass, the center of mass is this place, and so if I, if I hold this, I would say this smaller sphere 
at a bigger distance is supplying a torque which is a clockwise direction. But the bigger sphere at a shorter distance is applying a torque in the counterclockwise direction. And as we were talking about right when the last lecture ended and we were doing the net torque on this balance beam, we said here that the torques were equal. Not necessarily the force, see, this weighs more than that one. And not necessarily the distance, see, this one is further than, than that one. But this weight times this distance, so the torque, making it clockwise, is the same as this torque, making it go counterclockwise. And so the center of mass is the balance point. And it's not a balance because of the force, it's a balance because of the torque. It wants to pivot. It wants to rotate. And that's why I was saying it's difficult to really understand the center of mass and where it is until you understand that what you're trying to balance is not forces but torques and torques are forces and distance both and so the combination of the weight and the distance come into play you got to think about both of, of those and so that hopefully now that we understand torque gives you a little more insight of where the center of mass would be that's why that fun one let's see what I do with that uh, ah, here it is this, let me just pull this out here, but <clears throat> this one that I was showing you, uh, which is this bird, is, is such a fun one to, to see. Although, did I show you this? Maybe I didn't show you this one. Do you remember, Ron, if I pulled this one out? I don't, yeah, may, I, maybe I just showed you those two. So, so let me talk about the bird here. Uh, you can see that the bird seems to be balanced uh, by its beak, and, and sure enough, and if I, if I hold it up and I, and I look carefully at this and I draw a line across its beak here, actually there is a small amount of the wing tips that are just in the way I'm holding it above the beak. Of course, what you couldn't see in a classroom or on that video is inside of these wing tips, and if I hold it up to the light, there is lead inside. And so the wing tips don't have much distance above the beak, but they do have a lot of weight. Whereas the body of the bird is hollow plastic. And so it's got a lot of distance, but not much weight. And so the designers have taken advantage of this idea of torque and the center of mass to go ahead and make this distance look really long, which, which it is, but it's lightweight. And then this distance, just beyond the beak, very short, and they even angled the wings out really far so it doesn't look like it's really in front of the beak, but, but, but they are, in order to get it to balance. And it gives it that illusion of, of flight. And so it, the stand is really nice because then you can put it on there and then actually just kind of spin it around. And it really looks like the, the bird is kind of flying and hovering and maybe even, you know, defying the laws of physics and, and uh, just something weird about it. Uh, but it's not. It's just the, the uh, center of, of mass. And so with that in mind, I hope that gives you more insight to the center of mass. But it also gives you, I hope, then some insight to this next step, which is then what do we mean by stability? And I would say then something is stable. And so this bird is stable if it, you know, gets disturbed a little bit and it goes right back to its same place. It doesn't tip over. And so in the reason this works, of course, is because I'm supporting it right at its center of, of mass. And as long as the center of mass is actually somewhere within what I would call the base of it. Uh, let me explain. Uh, if I just took a rectangular block, and so I have kind of a boring rectangular block here, 
and I put it vertically on the table, uh, I would say it's, it's stable. I would say it's going to stay there. It's not going to, it's not going to fall down. Now, obviously, if I push it hard enough, it will. But if I give it a little nudge, no, but it, 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 it stays there. Now, a hard nudge, of course, it goes over. But when does it tip over? And so what I'm trying to say is somewhere in this block is the center of mass. Now, in this case, I have a nice uniformly shaped block. So the center of mass would probably be, if I was guessing, right in its center. I think that's a fair guess because, again, remember, it has to do with the torque. And so if I were, you know, holding this up here and putting my finger right about there, the distance out to there is the same as the distance out to there, but then also so is the, the weight of it. And so in this case, the center of mass is actually the center of the object. But look what happens if you were to tilt it a little bit. Maybe I'll just lift up one corner here and point out that, see, if the center of mass, in this case, is to the left of this corner, gravity would be supplying the force which leads to the torque which makes it pivot back to where it wants to go. And so it would go back this way. And if it went too far that way, then it would be, oops, you draw a little better than that. Something like this. And then if I draw a vertical line, you will see that the center of mass is to the right of the pivot. And then again, that would pull it back. And so I would say that this object is stable. And to, again, understand why it's stable, uh, I really need to understand torques and rotations. But the conclusion I'm trying to get you to see here is that I would say that anything is stable if its center of mass then is somewhere above or even below the base that supports it. And so in this case, it's directly above. Or put another way, what if I tilted it too much? Watch, what if I did this? What if I tilted this rectangular block so much that now its center of mass is to the right of the pivot point. See, what would gravity do there? Well, gravity would tend to keep it rotating and eventually topple it over. And so, as long as the center of mass is somewhere over the base, this is stable. So if I just move it a little bit to the side and let it go, it rotates it back. It's, it's stable. But if I give it too much of a tilt, then the center of mass is past the base and then rotates it all the way over. And so that's what we mean by center of mass and uh, stability. And in fact, the boring ones are, you know, these nice, even shapes. They get more interesting when they get to be, you know, say this shape here. And so, you know, the center of mass is over here. That is, if I, if I put my finger right here, well, I don't support it. And even if I put my fingers kind of wide right here and let it go, still doesn't support it. I've got to have the center of mass within the base. And in this case, the center of mass, I know exactly where it is, so I don't have to have a very big base to support it. Just the width of my finger can uh, support that. And again, when they have these weird shapes, like the flying bird here, you get this interesting 
uh, a fact here. Oops, I bumped my mic. Still on? Yeah, good. All right. So that being said, here's a fun one to look at also, is this cylinder. Now, if you look carefully at it, and I'll kind of hide the bottom here a little bit, but it does taper in at the top. And so if I were to draw a cylinder that then tapers in, and if I was then making a guess of where the center of mass is, instead of saying it's in the center of it, it's probably down a little bit lowered, of course, depending on how much tapering there is. But I do know that, again, where I would hold it, let's say right here, and so if you kind of imagine me holding it, you know, this way, oops, I'm supposed to hide the bottom here, that the center of mass, maybe even a little lower, since there would be more weight over here with a shorter distance and less weight and a further distance, that would make the center of mass lower than the midway point. And so that's the effect of this, this taper. And so as I hold this, not looking at the bottom quite yet, but the center of mass is probably, if, if I was guessing, uh, maybe right about there. Uh, certainly not halfway up, somewhere down here. But now showing you the bottom here, this one is actually cut at an angle. And so this looks something like this, and then tapered. And so fat, and then tapered. And so the center of mass on this one is purposely designed to be right about there. just inside the base. And, and so when you set this on a table, it gives it kind of a neat look. Where it's actually stable. But visually, humans like to put the center of mass at the center of the object. And they look at that and they go, that should fall over. And so, for me, that's kind of a neat one to look at. Again, like the bird. The bird's just kind of a neat one to look at. It's just kind of a human reaction to put the center of mass at the center, or at least somewhere near the center of the, of the object. But it's not necessarily that, 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 that simple. In fact, this one can be added to, and up at the top, I can put more wood on it. And maybe I'll change color so it'll, it'll stand out here. But if I put a little knob at the top, and in this case the knob flares out. So it's not adding all that much height compared to really how much weight it is adding. And what that does is that makes the center of mass move out, maybe to there. And of course, now the center of mass is beyond the base. And so like this comment here, uh, here, it tips it all the way over. And so that extra piece right there changes it from being stable like this to being unstable. Well, there's a bunch in here that I could show you, but I better just leave it at uh, one more, call it good. If, if I took this kind of this L-shaped object, most people look at this and say, okay, will it stay? And if you let it go, well, no. Uh, you might even kind of guess here that, okay, we've got a bunch of distance here, a bunch of distance here. Maybe the center mass is, is right here. And so, sure enough, right here is not over the base. And so it falls. Now, of course, this way, it would stay up, definitely. And so to get it to stay, I would have to somehow make sure that the center of mass is over the base. And my table's not very level. Let's see if 
I can use this. Oh great, this one rotates. Maybe that's not a good choice either. Ah, put that down. Stop it from rotating. But of course now it stands up and, and that's not really eye-catching but I think one that is eye-catching is even if you put this supporting beam right here. Too much rotation. Let me come down here. But if I put it right here, it looks like I can't quite get it from falling forward or back. Bummer. Ah. But the center of mass is just over the base. Ew. And uh, sorry, it looks like it keeps getting it falling forward and back. There we go. And so that's how it's supposed to look there. So that uh, the, uh, it's, it's, it's stable. And then that one to me looks a little interesting too. Not as much as the bird or that, uh, that black one there, but that's the idea. Okay, well, I better continue on because that's just some fun and useful, uh, important applications to this whole idea of torque and uh, what makes something stable and what is the meaning by the center of mass. Uh, let's continue on with our uh, discussion. And our discussion, as I said, uh, is trying to get all the parallels between what we did for translation and then move it into rotation. And one of the ones we haven't done yet is chapter 7. And uh, notice I kind of skipped over chapter 6 purposely. Uh, but in chapter 7 we learned about energy. And the energy of motion we called kinetic energy, one-half mv squared. And we measured it in joules. <clears throat> and we used a principle called conservation of energy. And maybe you recall from those, we would take objects like, oh, here's a stapler. Um, I had a one kilogram mass right here at the edge where this bird is. And I would drop it. And I would say something like, how fast is it going after, and one of the problems we did, was how fast is it going after it fell and it was just microscopically above the ground. We did another one where it fell 30 centimeters. But if you remember, we used the principle of conservation of energy. And so we had this equation for kinetic energy. We also had the equation for potential energy. We also had the equation for heat. What I want to add then is when it comes to rotation, that would also be an energy. Uh, we would call that also an energy of motion. Uh, let me uh, demonstrate here if I remove this. Uh, you might recall that earlier on in this chapter, trying to show you the different moments of inertia, I said this one would have a bigger moment of inertia than this one because there is more weight to it out at its rim than this one. This one's got a little weight at its rim, but most of the weight is distributed someplace within its interior. And so it's not as far out. And the big thing about the moment of inertia is it depended not only on the mass. Now remember, these have the same mass. These are both 610 grams. So they have the same mass, the same radius, the same color, but they don't have the same distribution of the, of the mass. And because of that, then we would say this one should have a larger moment of inertia. And so I use this little race here to kind of show you that, okay, if you let it go down, this one having a smaller moment of inertia can turn easier and would win as it, as it goes down. Okay, and although that's true, let me expand or at least change the uh, discussion to a discussion of energy. Because I would say then, as this object gets down at the bottom of the hill, so here it is, going down the bottom of the hill, it clearly is translating, so I would say it has some translational kinetic energy, but it's also rotating. And so at the bottom of this hill, this thing has energy 
in two different types of kinetic energy. In other words, if I just come back over to this wheel and I just spin the wheel, that has the ability to do work. Just the spinning part of it. So in other words, kinetic energy really comes in two flavors. It, it comes in an energy when things translate, but also an energy when they rotate. And so added to our list of what we learned in chapter 7 would be a kinetic energy of rotation. And for better or worse, we still just call it Ke, because it is a kinetic energy. And so the kinetic energy, we like to say, um, is not a different energy. It's still kinetic. It's energy of motion. But we do like to say it's a different flavor. It's an it's a energy of rotation. And so I want to point out here that what I'm adding to our list here is... If you want to call it another energy, that's fine, but it's still kinetic energy. But kinetic energy is broken down into two types. One type is kinetic energy of translational motion, and the other is a kinetic energy of rotational motion. And if you're beginning to see the analogy here, anybody want to make a guess of what you think the formula for the rotational kinetic energy would be? Now, do you see the parallelism here? So I bet there's a one-half. What's the equivalent of the mass? The rotational inertia. Uh, what's the equivalent of a translational speed? The rotational speed, which we called omega. And sure enough, that is the equation for the kinetic energy. And so what I'm trying to introduce you to here is this nether flavor of kinetic energy. And so if I was doing a problem with something going down a hill and it rotates as it goes down the hill. You, if you noticed in the other chapters, we never had objects that rotated as they went down the hill until this chapter. And so something like this disc as it goes down the hill Okay, it, it may start over here at some height and as it goes down the hill, down here, I would say it is both rotating and translating. And so it might look something like this if I drew a, a picture. And so I draw a picture. Uh, maybe this is the incline. Uh, maybe the incline has a height of H. Uh, maybe the little disc has a radius of R. It rolls down the hill and hits the bottom. And then at the bottom, it's rotating along. And if I were to apply conservation of energy, and so let me point out, I'm not changing that in very important principle, conservation of energy. All I'm trying to say is we need to expand what we did in Chapter 7. We need to include a rotational kinetic energy along with what we already talked about, which was uh, gravitational potential energy, translational kinetic energy, and heat. So this problem might look something like this. If you take all the energy before you let it go. So let's talk about that. What is all the energy before I let it go? Well, at this point in our discussion, you might say we have four. Because we, we had three before just now. We, we, we had heat energy. We had gravitational potential energy. And we had, we just called it kinetic. But now I'm calling it translational kinetic because we can also have rotational kinetic. Well, of those four, 
I would say at the beginning I only have gravitational potential energy. So on this side of the equation I would put mg and let me not put h because I want to be a little careful. h was what? The height from the ground. So if you look carefully at here The center of mass is higher than the incline by the radius of the disk. Okay, So what we meant in chapter 7 was that the height was the height above the table or ground, whatever our reference point is. So in my case, I would say it is H plus R. And so this gives me a chance to point out center of mass as well as what I really want to show you, which is rotational kinetic energy. Okay, so using the idea of the center of mass, I would say that the center of mass of this disk is not just the height of the incline, but it's also plus h, which is the radius of the disk. All right, so that's the energy it starts with. Only gravitational potential energy because it's at the top, it's not translating, it's not rotating, and we'll just say the heat is, is zero. Now, as it goes down the hill and it gets down here to the bottom, I would then say it still has some gravitational potential energy because remember we measure gravitational potential energy from the center of mass. And so there is a little bit of gravitational potential energy. It can't get lower than that, and, but it is a distance h above the table top. And of course it's also translating, so there would be a one-half mv squared. But it is also rotating, so there would be a 